All right, so we're going to be, I'm going to be looking at uh, dynamic movement processes of hooks and rivers spawning Atlantic sturgeon using multiple analytical perspectives, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it, it breaks down nicely into a few pieces as we move along here. Um, so I'm going to be spending a bulk of my time here discussing the two models that we worked on. Uh, but we'll, I'll go through the, our objective, of course, and uh, the structure of the data that we were working with. Um, so our objective, uh, where are these Atlantic sturgeon? Um, this is a dynamic process, obviously. They're moving up and down the river. And it's also a continuous process. Um, and why are they where they're at? Um, this is also a dynamic process. Why they're where they're at uh, changes throughout the throughout the season, throughout the years. Um, and this is a habitat use question, essentially. So we can translate the why into uh, um, why are they using this habitat. Um, and if we understand why they're using the habitat that they're using, then we can make predictions about why they might be where they are next. <laughs> so, um, so where and why is sort of our focus <laughs> here. Um, the data that I'm working with is uh, acoustic tags. Um, this is just an example of um, uh, dates tag, release locations, IDs, um, just what it looks like here. Um, sex and stage. Um, I think the big purpose of showing this here is the delightful names <laughs> that I have to work with. My personal favorite being in of this list being Gilbert Nettingham, um, or the sheriff of Nettingham, I suppose. <laughs> um, so. So we have the pinpointed locations of these tag sturgeon. Uh, there are 34 sturgeons, uh, 29 males, 4 females, 1 unknown. Um, and we have these data over 8 years, um, and 300 separate days over these 8 years. And if I'm remembering the dimensions of my data frame correctly, it was a, it's about 12,000 um, locations over these various times. So we have a lot of data to work with. Um, oh, very good. And this is just, there's, there were three different tags, so there were 100 day tags, one and a half year tags, and five year tags. Um, and from left to right, um, size and length increasing, um, just the, an example of the tags, and then the bottom here, uh, uh, sutures from the large tags. Um, so we've got some big fish here. Um, what we also have, we have data on the habitat as well. Uh, we have sediment, sediment maps, which for the purpose of this study, they can be very um, uh, very detailed sediment maps, uh, several different types of sediment environments and sediment types. For the sake of this study, we used um, mud, sand, and gravel as our uh, sediment descriptions here. And this is just an example of what, what that looks like when you're looking at it on your on your screen. Um, and then we also have a few other environmental variables such as water temperature and the, lo the location of the salt front as it moves <coughs> up and down uh, the Hudson. Okay, so the models. So moving on to the models, uh, I, we had two models we we're looking at. So the multiple analytical perspectives is, is two, which is one and one, I suppose. Um, so we have what I'm calling an individual based model and a location-based model. The individual-based model is just uh, just referring to um, the sturgeon themselves. We're, we're worried, we're concerned with when do we see or when do we capture the sturgeon. Um, and the associated photograph is just a, a, an example of the pinpointed locations of, this, of the sturgeon. So when do we see them and when not do, do, or when do we not see the sturgeon. And then the second model I'll be discussing is uh, location-based. So from the perspective of a habitat, if I'm a piece of habitat in the Hudson and these are my characteristics, do I see a sturgeon, do I not see a sturgeon? Um, how many sturgeon, perhaps? Uh, so individual-based, um, when do we see the sturgeon? Uh, we can translate this as a detection probability. Um, and what affects our ability to see the sturgeon are the covariates of the model that we put in. Um, and our working hypothesis for this model is that detection is less than one. If it is one, that's great. You always see your sturgeon, um, but typically you see detections less than one. Um, and we suspected that this uh, detection was affected by the date or and the search range, perhaps. Uh, the year, maybe it changes over the years, um, maybe 
maybe it changes depending on the size of the fish, uh, the sex of the fish, um, especially since, you know, we notice we have 29 males and four females, you know, is there a difference there? Um, so you can see the structure of the model is over there on the right. Um, the full equation isn't written out mainly just because it's hideous and huge. So um, it's a binomial model. Um, the detection that you see there, the I and J, that's fish I on day J. Um, and uh, that P1, that's detection probability and then one trial. We're looking for these individual fish. Um, and uh, the way that we structure these data to, to work with this model is the detection history of the individuals. Um, I have an example there. The NAs are just to show that different fish were tagged at different times. So sometimes the fish would show up as an NA. Like if, you, if it's not tagged yet, you can't, it's not a trial. <laughs> so, um, and then this model, it predicts the detection probability for each, for every individual, for every sampling day. Um, and I formulated this model as a, a Bayesian capture-recapture. It, it's sort of a variation on the theme of the capture-recapture model. Um, and I ran this one in JAGS. Uh, 10,000 iterations only took about five minutes, which I was very pleased. I've run some before and it took like six hours. Um, but if you look over here in this table on the right, you'll see, uh, um, you'll see how uh, how the covariates sort of fell out <coughs> there. So we have uh, the range actually fell out of the model as not important. So how much of the river we searched didn't matter. If you search a small area, search a big area, you still see the same uh, detection probability of the fish. But it was time that was most important. Also length, which I originally was like, oh, maybe that's a proxy for age, but not for fish that are sexually mature. So there's something else going on there um, biologically, but it was highly significant. So um, so what do we get from this model? Obviously we get, you know, information about our detection process, which in and of itself is interesting. You know, when are we, uh, we're going out and looking for these sturgeon, we've tagged them, but we don't always see them. Um, so that in and of itself I think is interesting, but also you can use those detection probabilities of the individuals to get at least population ballparks or estimates. Um, and in this case the model sums the reciprocal of the detection probabilities uh, to get these <coughs> population estimates, which you see for a few years. Didn't plot all of the years because it got a little a little messy, but you, you see the, the estimates for a few years over there with their associated credible intervals. Um, and again, these are ballparks like uh, don't go home and say, oh, there's 2,000 <laughs> sturgeon in the Hudson River. <laughs> these are just, um, and you'll notice they're daily, and so that's another utility of this model is that um, since it's run over time and day by day, you can see you can ask, you know, how we're, we're in June, how many fish might we expect to be in the river at this time since they, you know, they're an address, so they move in and they move out. Um, so moving from that to the location-based model, um, which these aren't official terms, this is just what I made up to keep them straight in my head. <laughs> but uh, do we see the sturgeon in a specific subset of the habitat? In, in this case, we can take the same data and we can organize it as counts in various areas of the river. Um, and we sub, if you saw earlier in the slides, you saw the little the grids on the Hudson River, the 250 by 250 meter grids. Um, we, I organize those as counts in those grids. So our working hypothesis for this model was they do exhibit a habitat preference. What that is. Maybe our model will tell us. Um, so this might be affected by the sediment type, uh, the Julian day, the year, the river mile, uh, similar variables. Um, this was not run in JAGS. This was one of the this is one of the <coughs> twelve hour models that I'm still refining. But uh, uh, this is a generalized linear model. It's similar, only the I and the J. The I it's grid I. So grid you know three hundred and seventy five on on day J, um, 
using the logit link function, the same as the last model. Um, but our trials, as opposed to being one, uh, is the number of fish that are tagged at the time, which again changes as the time progresses. Uh, so we have counts by day for each grid, looks similar. Um, same with NAs because there were, there were some grids that weren't seen on different days because the whole river couldn't be sampled every, every time that you went out. Uh, and so um, you can see over there, the table on the right again is how, um, how the covariates fell out. And again, this is a, this is a, a logit, this binomial model with a, with a classic logit link. So if some of those numbers look, look a little funky. That would be why. Um, so this model, it predicts the success probability for each grid cell. So you go out, um, you're in a certain portion of the river, um, what's the probability on this day that you might see a fish? Um, okay, so what do we get from this model? Um, again, we get the probability of seeing a fish. Um, it's time varying. Uh, uh, not only by day, but by year. This is just an example of uh, um, how some of the plotted, these are predicted success probabilities over uh, the eight years, starting in 2006. Um, there's about, I think, over the eight years with the 300 days, and it's like 6,000 grids. It's, it's about a million uh, things, and so, uh, violin plots there to try to visualize that. But I think even more useful um, are these maps here. So here's a map of the binomial success probability. And this is just one of the maps. So there's a map for each of the 300 days, um, which is really interesting to look at. So this is, uh, just for reference, this is about t river mile 26 to river mile 38. So uh, near the bottom portion of the river, and this is at the end of the first year. So it's like the last sampling day of the first year. And these are the predicted binomial success probabilities for each grid. Um, and they're normalized for the extent of the river. Um, so all of these uh, values sum to one um, for each day. Uh, and you can, so you can, that's, so that's why the scale is um, such low values. But, uh, so that's interesting in and of itself, and the population estimates are interesting in and of, the, uh, in and of themselves. Um, but what's really interesting about these two models is that the latter model, the, the expected value of um, the, any binomial model is your number of trials, or in this case the number of individuals, times your detection probability, um, or success probability in this case. Um, so we can actually take our population estimates and multiply them by the probability, the normalized probabilities for this map and get an expected number of fish dynamically over these different days. Um, so here's pretty much, I mean, this looks, if it looks exactly the same as the other map, it, it's because it showed that each of these things are multiplied by the same number. Um, but notice the scale is different. So um, again, you'll notice uh, there a lot of these values are near zero, but the the model does a, a fairly decent job of predicting where we expect to see these fish. So um, two here, two there, one there, and then zero elsewhere. And as you, um, which this isn't scrollable, but on the map itself, you scroll down, they're sort of crowded near the bottom. Uh, I suppose as they're um, as they're exiting or getting ready to. Um, all right, so if you have, a, if you have any questions, um, I'd like to, uh, the funding provided by the DEC, um, uh, this is a lot of work went into tracking <coughs> these fish. Um, so that's a lot of data that came out of that, which has proven very interesting. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.